and good afternoon all. Uh, I'm going to release my screen now again. Let me see. Yeah, you have it? Yes. You, can you see? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So uh, let's come, or, or let, let me give a few words um, as an introduction. You know, uh, I am the neurosurgeon uh, who is since maybe almost 30 years, very interested in uh, treating cavernous malformations. Actually, this was never my, my initial purpose. You know, when, when, when you're a young doctor, uh, you may not know how your career will develop and in which direction. But somehow I, uh, I noticed my personal interest in cavernous malformations and uh, the complexity of this, of this uh, uh, di vascular disease of the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, and you know much better, I think, than many, many doctors all over the world that cavernoma uh, has so many aspects. So that the surgical aspect I'm going to talk about today and also not in the general surgical, just relating uh, to the brain stem is something very special, but it's, it's something uh, um, very unilateral. So cavernoma has so many other aspects uh, and um, I, I cannot touch them all. I will try to sh give you an insight in uh, what a surgeon can do. And maybe I will uh, also give you a few words how a surgeon feels when he takes the responsibility of uh, treating a, a cavernoma. Uh, let me see now, let's go to the next one. So my relationship with um, the uh, cavernoma alliance is long and <laughs> this is just, you, you know who, who this gentleman is, uh, <laughs> Ian. Uh, I made this as a, like a small joke because I, I covered the faces of my patients. Yeah, I will show my patients after the surgery, but uh, as you will publish this and everybody can see, so I, I covered that uh, no one uh, feels offended and uh, can be really recognized on my slides. Everything began for me already 12 years ago when uh, I got acquainted with uh, Ian and uh, Ian was so, uh, so nice to invite me to come to London. So I came in 2010. Then I came in 2013. And again, look, look at the nice smile, big laugh actually uh, of Ian. Then I came in 15. And then again, I came in 19. That was last time. Maybe you, many of you have uh, attended that meeting too. And uh, now we have um, uh, 2022. So it's uh, a little bit already a, a small history, uh, my relationship with the uh, uh, CAUK. Let's come to the brainstem. The brainstem is uh, one of the oldest parts of the brain. It is located exactly in the, in the midline, in the axis of, the, uh, of our brain. And um, here, the lower part extends downward as the um, uh, spinal cord. So the brainstem is actually the region where the tra transition between our head and brain and the uh, remaining body is made. And uh, the intrinsic anatomy is quite complex. So I'm not giving a lecture now about brainstem anatomy, but uh, this is one very important aspect. And not only anatomists should know the, the structure of the brainstem, but also a neurosurgeon should know it very well. The brainstem has three levels or three parts, which is uh, arbitrarily made by us because we like to classify everything and uh, this, this makes us uh, understand things better, but the nature doesn't care about uh, classifications. Yeah, so this is actually the brain stem and the rest of the brain is, is one complex structure, but we uh, divide the brain stem into the midbrain, the upper part, into the pons or so the bridge in the middle part and into the um, medulla or medulla oblongata, which is uh, continuous then with the spinal cord. And accordingly in each region, if 
a problem occurs. In the case of carbonoma, it is a bleeding. But uh, I, I'm also treating other lesions like various tumors that can also uh, arise uh, within the brain stem. Then depending on this region, the symptoms are quite typical, but symptoms from here are very different than the symptoms caused by problems in the pons or by problems in the medulla. So already from the clinical picture, already we can uh, understand in, in which part of the brainstem a problem may be. And of course, we have a, a good imaging, so the uh, magnetic resonance imaging will tell us exactly the morphology. So I'm, I will go, I try to, to be brief and uh, please tell me if, if I'm, too, if I'm uh, too long with my speech. So I will go through these points, indication for surgery. Each of these points is, is worth to, uh, uh, for a lecture, you know, because this is a very complex issue. Basically, we see an indication to treat with surgery when the surgical treatment appears to be more beneficial than not doing anything else. Sounds simple, it's very complex, yeah? But actually, I, especially because I see so many patients uh, with carbonomas from, from many, many countries, uh, uh, this is my basic philosophy, treat only if you can be pretty sure that patient will benefit from the surgery. If the risk seems too high or many other aspects uh, uh, are maybe against uh, surgical treatment, then uh, we should either postpone it or, or not even uh, um, go for surgery. For, is, for instance, this is a, um, a huge lesion within the lower part of the brain stem, which actually was diagnosed as a cavernous malformation by uh, many radiologists, but it might be one. Uh, it could be also a so-called tel angiectasia or a so-called mixed lesion. And um, it's not, it's not uh, affecting the patient clinically. So it, it, it makes almost no symptoms. Yeah? Patients sometimes have a small accident and then they will receive an MRI just to make sure that everything is good in the brain. And uh, then such kind of lesion can be detected. Uh, and also some kind of black spots, which are not seen in all uh, sequences of the MRI, but in special sequences, we can see these black spots. These black spots are hemosiderin, which stems from the uh, uh, hemoglobin. Yeah, uh, that's the red color of our blood. And um, the hemoglobin can, can um, enter into the brain by uh, increased permeability of the blood vessels. So the red blood cells, they, uh, cells, they can escape and uh, they will be deposited in the brain or in the spinal cord or in any part, and then they uh, can be detected. But these lesions are not cavernomas. And uh, this is confusing because many radiologists will tell the patient you have, and then they start counting one, two, three, four, five, six, and then they will tell the patient you have uh, uh, 35 cavernomas in your brain, which is not true, actually. Yeah, they, uh, these are not cavernomas. They can develop into one. And sometimes only one of these lesions will, uh, over the years, can develop into a cavernoma, and then all the others will stay like this. So, of course, these are not subject for uh, surgical treatment. But if we, if we uh, decide for treatment, uh, for surgical treatment, then the timing is an uh, important aspect. Do the surgery immediately uh, because patients may come to a neurological department or, or to the doctor and say, uh, oh, I have this and that, you know, double vision or whatsoever. Yeah. Symptoms can mimic stroke. So sometimes uh, patients are diagnosed as stroke, but this is not the ischemic stroke. Yeah, this is caused by uh, uh, intrinsic bleeding in the brainstem uh, with uh, quite similar symptoms. And then what to do? Shall we wait or not? So if in some instances it is good to wait, in, in others not. And for example, here, uh, initially, it was decided uh, it is much too dangerous to operate here, so we will wait. That was okay for the beginning, but after 16 months, this uh, 
cavernoma bled again, developed in, in a young lady and uh, developed uh, as a big hemorrhage. And then within 10 days, a huge hemorrhage occurred. So she became almost comatose and uh, paralyzed and so on. So she was in a, in a really life uh, threatening situation. And then immediate surgery could evacuate this bleeding and look how beautifully the brainstem restores anatomically because all what we can see here is blood inside the, the tissue, but the tissue is not, the, the brainstem tissue is not destroyed, which is very important because in ischemic stroke, uh, by uh, lack of blood supply, the brain tissue will be destroyed. It will be it, 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 like an infarction in, in uh, cardiac infarction. Yeah, some part of the tissue will be completely destroyed, but not in, not necessarily in cavernoma. This is the nice thing because uh, patients can recover even from such uh, severe bleeding. Now compared to uh, to other uh, lesions, maybe the number of 312 is not that high, but uh, you will not find in Europe any other neurosurgeon uh, with the number of uh, 300, uh, more than 300 cases of brainstem cavernomas. And all over, I may have operated maybe 1,500 or almost 2,000 patients with all kinds of cavernomas in the brain and spinal cord. But the brainstem is very, is very special. And... Um, as I said, I'm very careful with the indication. So uh, I have, I, I, on the observation, so many other patients that do not need surgery. I, I know them, they came to see me or uh, they have contact with me now per email and send me their control images, but uh, surgery is not necessary. But if we need surgery, that is if the lesion, the bleeding is huge and if the, the clinical symptoms, especially if they are progressive, so patients are getting worse and worse and worse, then uh, we should proceed with surgery. And the morphology in the midbrain, you see this is only for midbrain, is very heterogeneous. So we have uh, published a number of um, reports about um, midbrain cavernous malformations, how they can be uh, classified, for example, according to the morphological type. They can be small, they can be uh, confined to only one region within the uh, midbrain or to two regions or even to three regions within the whole uh, midbrain. And then they can extend superiorly into the thalamus. They can extend downwards into the pons. And uh, we try to find out if this morphology plays a role. Also recently, we tried to find out another aspect. Many neurosurgeons believe that uh, if a cavernous malformation is deep inside the brainstem, so you will not see it on the surface, and it is quite at the depth uh, beneath, uh, beneath the surface, then you should not touch it because you have to traverse this uh, healthy uh, brainstem tissue and they think you might uh, cause harm. But to make the story very short, we have analyzed this, uh, our cases statistically, and we found out that these cases here with the deep-seated ones actually were clinically better on the long term than the other ones. Uh, this has some connection with the size also, but uh, it shows that a deep location per se is actually not something uh, bad. It can be, uh, uh, we, we can work on this. So this stands for normal, normal aspect of the brainstem. This is a yellow discoloration outside. This is a bulging because uh, sometimes we can see the cavernoma bulging out and this is an exophytic when the cavernoma already is bulging very much out. And uh, who is interested in uh, uh, this uh, publication, you will find it of course easily. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, depicted and we have shown our examples. We have uh, shown how we access, because this is a very important surgical aspect, from, from where can you um, expose a certain region of the brainstem? This is uh, really something very special because um, we always in surgery, wherever we open our head, because of the deep location of the brainstem, we all always will have a very small, a tiny window. 
but we cannot see the whole brainstem uh, in, in one surgery. Yeah, so uh, for this reason, uh, choosing uh, uh, the appropriate approach uh, is extremely important. Yeah? And we can, uh, we can enter to expose the midbrain, which is, you see, exactly in the center of the brain from all directions. So 360 degrees, we can enter from anteriorly, from anterolaterally, from laterally, from posterolaterally, and from posteriorly. And uh, I, depending on where we have to go, the positioning of the patient and the skin incision plays a role. And then we will get this specific window that we can anticipate, of course, from our imaging already. But it needs, it needs experience and, um, Sometimes my colleagues um, sent me an email with images and uh, say, Helmut, what, what would you do in this case? Or how would you approach this? Uh, just recently, I got one again from Spain. And of course, I gladly respond. I, I'm very happy to share my experience with my other colleagues and then telling them how I did it in the past and how, how I would do this specific case. So you see these points indicate all um, entry points into the midbrain. One of these uh, very interesting approaches from, an, uh, from an anteriorly, and I know that very few neurosurgeons dare to do this because it is um, very demanding. And there are some very important structures nearby, like the hypothalamus and these small, small structures here, which are the mammillary bodies, related to the so-called um, limbic system. And this one is responsible for our short memory. And uh, if any damage occurs to this, to this structure, patients may lose their short memory, and which is a very affecting, even if, if they can uh, move everything, they, have no, may, they may have no neurological deficits, but losing the short memory is, is very difficult because patients cannot even leave the house because they cannot find their way back or so. So this should not happen, of course. And the surgeon must be aware of um, all these problems that can occur by, uh, let's say, uh, by, by mistake. But you are not allowed. In, in neurosurgery, you are not allowed to do mistakes, yes? And um, over the years, uh, every neurosurgeon learns how to, to cope with this, how to adapt, how to, you know, to balance himself mentally to be, to be able, on the one hand, to do a highly concentrating work. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, also never forget, even during the surgery, do not forget that this is a human being who trusts your skills and uh, trusts your, your uh, philosophy. And there is a family uh, behind and uh, you have to do a good job to uh, save this patient from further bleeding and uh, not adding any additional damage, which is a pretty uh, a high responsibility. For example, if you have a cavernous malformation in this posterior lateral region of the midbrain, this is the midbrain, we can choose basically three different approaches, which all will expose the lesion. One from the side, one from the posterior uh, lateral uh, region, one from the posterior midline region. But each of them have uh, advantages and disadvantages. I don't need to go now into many details. It, it would be more interesting for, for neurosurgeons to know how, when to choose this and that. But um, I just wanted to show that we have these possibilities. Maybe sometimes I can show a very short uh, video clip how we expose. We have these important veins in the temporal region that must be preserved. So we cannot damage such kind of vein because it will alter the function of the brain. We have to nicely expose. And at the end of the surgery, you see the surface, the surface of the temporal lobe should be intact. Of course, here, here are the, the post-operative images. Here is the skin incision, and this is after the surgery. So um, I, I have many examples which actually are uh, more or less redundant. So I will uh, sometimes I will um, skip or go very fast, so not to lose too much time. This is something similar here. 
again, midbrain under a lateral uh, region, we can go beneath the temporal lobe, so the so-called subtemporal uh, area. This is the temporal lobe here. And uh, there is a special technique how to gently elevate the uh, midbrain with for a few millimeters to get there, evacuate the problem, which is the hemorrhage and the cavernoma, and then uh, leave everything else more or less untouched or intact. Patient may have a oculomotor paresis, which uh, uh, means that she cannot move her eye properly, but also she cannot open the eyelid properly, which after nine or 10 months recovered nicely, as we can see here. So uh, many of these deficits that are caused either by the bleeding or even can be as a side effect of surgery are reversible and uh, can normalize again. Redundant case, but this time it's uh, an approach from posteriorly. Uh, usually we operate, if, uh, with few exceptions, we operate with the patient positioned in the sitting. So uh, we can access, this is a skin incision, and uh, we can access the midbrain superior to the cerebellum and inferior to the so-called uh, tentorium. The tentorium is this part which separates the occipital lobe from the cerebellum. Cerebellum here, just by releasing the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the white area here, will fall down by gravity. Not very much, but even uh, up to uh, the 10, 11 millimeters or something, which gives a uh, an important space to work without damaging anything. Of course, we do not damage these veins. They, they are important for the, for the cerebellum. We do not damage especially arteries because they supply the cerebellum and we not, do not damage anything around here in the brainstem. So we have a good access, a direct access to a very deep region in the brain without cutting anything else than the dura mater outside, of course. Yeah, yeah. I can skip, this is uh, uh, after the surgery, similar case. Um, I like if my patients smile after the surgery. So you will see many of them uh, uh, like to smile after the surgery or even show the thumb that they are uh, as a proof that they are doing well, yeah. So maybe I, I do not need to explain each case because can, you can imagine that each of these patients have a, a case history. They have a family around. They have a, sometimes uh, they went to many doctors before and this and that. So it's, a, it's an interesting story, actually, every single case, but not for this lecture, of course. Uh, this young lady, uh, she came from uh, the Middle East. Uh, part and um, I was very happy that I could really take this very deep cavernoma nicely. She had initially more oculomotor paris than before surgery, but later on she almost normalized. So this came back to 90-95% of function again. Redundant case, huge lesion, but uh, again, you see by evacuating this after the surgery on the MRI, one may have the impression that a lot of uh, um, a lot of parenchymal tissue, so the substance of the brainstem is missing, but it's actually not missing. The cavernous malformation has just pushed it aside. The cavernoma and the bleeding of the cavernoma, they do not destroy or, or with, with few exceptions and very little, but usually they do not destroy the tissue. So uh, we can see a cavity after the surgery like this, and patients still have their full function because all the structures are compressed in this remaining part. And you see the patient with his thumb up uh, doing well after the surgery as well. I have, uh, for example, here given many examples of uh, pediatric cases. Uh, and uh, shown like this. So there are uh, also explanations about the, the case history and so on. So who is interested can find this in my previous publications. Again, a redundant case, supracerebellar approach. Um, I, if you wish to see a video or shall I skip this? Just tell me, please. No. This is okay. 
Is it okay? So yes. this is the this is the dura dura mater, which is covering the brain and the cerebellum. And you see, this is the surface of the cerebellum, and this dura mater now will be sutured here to the upper bony ridge, elevating it a little bit. And here already we can see some draining veins. And then in the more anterior portion, in every healthy person, we have this thick arachnoid membrane. And after cutting this arachnoid membrane, we will expose the midbrain. This is part of the uh, midbrain. This is the so-called fourth nerve that is uh, moving our eyes to the inner side and downwards. Only this nerve is responsible for this uh, uh, movement of the eye. And superior to that, we can enter into the hemorrhagic cavity. So the good thing is sometimes in the early phase after a, after a bleeding, uh, the blood is not yet uh, solid. It is more or less fluid. So when we evacuate it, we can uh, rinse it with the saline solution or a ringer solution. And then we will enter into a cavity which facilitates the, the exposure and uh, manipulation within the brainstem because already we have this space made by the hemorrhage. So this is an argument uh, uh, and I'm uh, following this since many years to rather operate in the early phase before the blood has had the chance to uh, get very solid and uh, even with the scar formation. But you can see how um, a cavernous malformation looks like in surgery. It is something very heterogeneous and it's so important to be sure that in all these areas, this is the resection cavity inside, in all these areas there is no remaining portion because once we may leave even if it's only one or two millimeters of the lesion then it may recur. This is a genetic uh, drive that uh, may uh, lead again to um, a new bleeding in the later stage. Uh, what, what we found actually in, in our um, analysis of the midbrain cavernous malformations that, uh, and we could prove that early surgery uh, yields better results than surgery in a later stage. Also, we saw that uh, there are some uh, predictors of the outcome, like the size of the uh, midbrain cavernoma, patient's age, and also a, um, uh, a poor clinical, uh, clinical condition at the beginning. If the patients are in a very poor condition due to a, maybe to a very severe bleeding, then also the results were not that good as in patients who came in a, in a very good clinical condition. So these are the, the, the basics. I will leave the midbrains and come to the pons cavernous malformation. We have again a, a huge heterogeneity and uh, we have uh, several approaches, not exactly the same like for the midbrain, but uh, in a similar way. One of this is also good for, for the uh, pons and uh, I will briefly show why, because in the pons, this posterior structure as you can see my cursor, yeah? You, you see the cursor, the, the computer cursor, yes. So this posterior structure here um, contains important uh, nuclei for the eye movement and um, going through the posterior midline, I, I will go into more detail immediately, going through the posterior midline will damage most probably these structures and then patients may we stay thereafter with the um, eye movement disorder maybe permanent one or they can even uh, stay with a uh, facial paralysis over time yeah so this should be avoided but i will show a, a few other cases uh, quite similar to the midbrain exposure with the supracerebellar and uh, uh, this just to give you an impression how patients uh, can uh, look like before and uh, after surgery. I will skip the video, it's, it's quite similar. And uh, let's come to the CP angle. This uh, young girl actually had a previous surgery in another hospital, but you see, 
it was uh, she was operated through the posterior midline and actually the facial nerve she has a facial paralysis on the right side a facial nerve was already damaged and uh, the majority of the cavernous malformation was not removed so actually a useless surgery i must say it, which is it's very sad for the for the patient uh, i chose another uh, lateral approach to avoid uh, interference with facial nerve and so on. I let this young boy because in, in the in the meantime he's big and he he doesn't look any more like he looks here on this picture. Mm. <laughs> uh, but I remember him uh, uh, very well. Uh, he was really nice and uh, he made it so well. After the surgery, immediately he started to play around with his uh, toys from the from the first day after surgery. Uh, redundant cases I may skip. Here, for example, what I want to show is that um, you see this white area. Here the, the blood is black and here the blood is white, yeah, but this is a di different sequence where the uh, all the water content, so this is the cerebral spinal fluid, the white one, yeah, is white and also all this white area indicates that there is a accumulation of fluid which is an edema so it's not only the size of the bleeding that causes clinical problems like you see no cell vomiting dysphagia and so on but this edema also the edema is caused by the sudden compression of the brain stem and then the blood circulation within the brain stem is not interrupted but it's disturbed and uh, this condition should be um, treated as soon as possible by evacuating the bleeding. Then the microcirculation within the brainstem will restore and patient can uh, uh, also come back into a very, very good uh, clinical uh, condition without neurological deficits. This is something important. I, I mentioned, if I can, I would prefer to go laterally because uh, this area is when we elevate, this is an anatomical specimen. If we elevate the cerebellum with the vermis here, we look into the so-called fourth ventricle. And uh, here, this is called the rhomboid fossa. And here we can see some uh, two structures which are the so-called facial colliculus. So our facial nerves, they um, originate within the brainstem in a deeper region, but then they come here to the surface, traverse from medially to laterally, and then, well, oh, sorry, uh, go back. And then will come out of the brainstem here. Yeah. But you can damage this facial nerve, sorry, it's a little bit higher here. You can damage the facial nerve by damaging this area. So for, for this approach, we need a um, good electrophysiological monitoring. We have an electric probe where we can uh, stimulate the, this rhomboid fossa. This is from surgery. And F means facial nerve response. And this is no response, the blue, uh, like a zero, yeah? No response, no response. But here we have a response, response, response. And so we mapped, in many patients, we mapped this area where we, where we get a facial response and a lesion inside the brain, seem like a hemorrhage, will heavily distort this area. So in, in surgery, we almost never will find two nice facial colliculi as we can see in the anatomical specimen, because this may be distorted, extended, pushed aside and so on. So without this electrophysiological uh, monitoring, we cannot know where the fibers of the facial nerve run. And there is also one important structure. It's for the sixth nerve. The sixth nerve is just uh, um, uh, innervating our uh, the, the eye, the outside eye muscle. So it will turn the eye, the, the right eye to the right, the left eye to the left. Only this single muscle. Yeah. So the six, a six nerve palsy uh, will mean that patients cannot look to the side with one eye, and they they may have a heavy uh, double vision. Long history of this patient. Also, I skip. 
and uh, I will show, um, yeah, this is a so-called skull base uh, approach. Uh, this is the cochlear nerve for the hearing, and this is the facial nerve exiting the brainstem. And uh, this area um, also is very special because here we have a lot of nerves. This is the lower pons, and here is the facial nerve. Here is the uh, cochlear nerve and vestibular cochlear also for the balance. And then we have the ninth and the 10th and more, uh, more inferiorly the 11th and 12th nerves. So these are responsible for uh, our um, voice, for the larynx innervation, uh, the, the vagus even is a very strong nerve that even goes down to, to the heart, uh, also controlling uh, the heartbeat. And uh, damaging these uh, fascicles of the caudal nerves would mean a um, very heavy uh, neurological impact to, to patients. Yeah, they, could, they cannot swallow, they may need a tracheostoma or something. Yeah, so we have to avoid this. And um, by a special exposure, this is what I want to show, by this special exposure, we can avoid any traction and we can get a um, sufficiently lateral to medial and inferior to superior viewing trajectory to operate in this area. Because it, it's useless if you have the nicest manual technique, but you, you cannot access into the region because the bone or what, whatever um, hinders you to enter, then uh, you cannot evacuate safely uh, this uh, malformation. And um, there are many examples where I don't need to show, but we have also analyzed the, the anatomical variations of, this is always the same region, sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right side, but it's always this uh, lower CP angle region. And uh, also the anatomy varies from patient to patient. So it's not, or if, if you did it well in one patient, it doesn't mean that you can do it exactly in the same um, uh, good manner in another patient. Yeah, so you need uh, really to have this experience. But here um, we analyzed uh, our cases in which we were able, or, or theoretically, uh, um, we had the possibility to either approach from laterally or from medially, because this, uh, this cavernous malformation indeed, it can be accessed from here or from here. And uh, to make the, short, uh, the, the story very short, uh, it is important to avoid this, this uh, six nerve nucleus, which is here, then uh, the, the fibers of the facial nerve that cross over here, and also a small structure here that is also responsible for the conjugate eye movement. Uh, there are very nice anatomical studies showing these structures. These are the fibers of the facial nerve here. So we know the facial nerve inside the brainstem, we have seen it, but this is inside the brainstem, these fibers, and it originates here and then it's coming out here. So we can damage it here. So we, we must really know very well uh, these structures. This is just a, a schematic uh, uh, drawing from our uh, uh, publication two years ago, showing that um, if we choose a medial approach, uh, it is very likely to damage the sixth nerve nucleus, which is for the eye movement laterally, and the, or, or the seventh nerve trajectory here. And then patients may have postoperatively a, a facial palsy and a sixth nerve palsy and problems like this. So by knowing this and uh, by knowing how to choose or in which patient to choose the appropriate approach, we can avoid this, uh, these problems. Now, I know from many of my colleagues that they would say, oh, this is a huge cavernoma and uh, there is, it is very close to the posterior surface. Here is the rhomboid fossa. Yeah, this is the fourth ventricle. So we, we can go through the fourth ventricle. But look what happens after the surgery. This small area here, you see, is only compressed by the bleeding. After evacuating the bleeding, this whole area becomes so thick, look, from here to here. So if you traverse from here 
you will damage all these structures in your way here. And uh, uh, this is not allowed, of course, but uh, it, it happens. Neurosurgeons decide to go, they say, oh, this is the closest, this is the closest, shortest way to, to approach the lesion, so let's go from here. And then they may damage all this uh, structure here. I have published this uh, and I have shown it many times in my lectures. So at least this is what uh, I can do to um, also give this experience or share this experience with uh, many other of my colleagues. But sometimes if the cavernoma already is bulging out in the region of the fourth ventricle, like we can see here, you see it's bulging out, then of course there is no use to go from laterally, sorry. There is no use to go from lateral, so we have to go through the uh, to this uh, through this rhomboid fossa and evacuate nicely. And then the facial monitoring is helping us very much. This is the electric probe here, which gives us a response. It it stimuli, and then we we, we can hear the sound because the, the the machine will give us the sound of the response of the facial nerve, and then we hear it like tok 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 tok. So we know okay. The facial nerve is there and uh, uh, is intact. Here we can see that the patient postoperatively has a, a good eye movement because we approach the lesion from, from laterally. And I'm very sure that if we have chosen to go from medially, then she may have had at least a sixth nerve palsy permanently, probably, or even also additionally a facial palsy. So I think. Uh, I uh, have shown this message clearly enough. Now the, the lowest part and the last here um, in my lecture is the medulla, which is uh, also um, very complex structure, but totally different from the pons, totally different from the midbrain. So all these structures uh, that we encounter in the medulla, uh, if they are affected, they may cause totally different symptoms like uh, swallowing problems or um, a palsy of the tongue, a hypoglossal palsy, or, um, well, many other symptoms, of course, yeah, like motor symptoms, sensory symptoms. But the, as uh, the lower part of the brainstem, this medulla, is more easily accessible than pons and midbrain, uh, the surgery is not usually. <laughs> is not that difficult than a uh, midbrain uh, cavernoma surgery or a, a pons cavernoma surgery. Sometimes I uh, uh, I agreed, not many times, but four or five times, I agreed to also operate uh, live. So uh, th this was organized by the Queen Square in London. And uh, I did the surgery in uh, Hanover of course, with, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, the consent of the patient, so the patient knew about, and um, she, she was okay for this. And uh, the audience in, uh, in London, they could see live the surgery. And the next day I took the airplane and uh, came there and giving the lecture and uh, also uh, meeting um, uh, those people. But now recently, because of the pandemic, where the, um, I, uh, I, I stopped doing these things and also, Maybe I leave it for, for uh, younger people in the future <laughs> because this is very demanding. You know, th these are difficult surgeries per se. And then doing, doing it live, when you know that so many people are watching your surgery directly, then you should not be um, absolutely not be affected by this. You may not be nervous or something. You, you, you should have your technique like, like always, which I, I can do, but um, it's not that easy. <laughs> So medullary cavernous malformations, um, uh, easier to access. We can operate them very nicely. You see a good eye movement after the surgery. I would like to, to show the patients completely, but uh, I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, these are one of the last uh, cases. Um, again, there are so many clinical aspects to, to be mentioned, but I think uh, there is no time and um, it may also be not that interesting to, to give too many details now about uh, clinical uh, history, case history, and so on. Um, coming to the results. Mm, 
in, in, in these 312 patients, uh, I did not update the, the last ones. But uh, I, I just show now from our publication in the midbrain that uh, we had really good results uh, in terms of um, uh, long-term follow-up. More than 90% of the patients are really in an excellent condition, which for me is very important. And uh, which also, also these results were supporting my work because I knew I, I I can do it. And in very few cases, we had problems, uh, but not that serious problems. And usually if patients did not do that well, after the surgery, they already were in a critical condition uh, beforehand. We had some complications, but fortunately I did not have uh, uh, catastrophic complications that uh, patient was completely turned into the wheelchair or something or, or becoming permanently comatose or something, no such thing happened. And this is also in part um, due to the way of doing the surgery, but also in part by how to select the appropriate cases. So if, if I can anticipate that my surgery may rather harm the patient than help, then of course I will not uh, recommend the surgery, I will not do the surgery, yeah? But sometimes we can have problems that are not related to the surgery itself, like a coagulopathy, so patients can have a bleeding thereafter. Uh, in some of these bleeding cases, I reoperated, uh, and only one patient needed three surgeries to, uh, to be healed. But I always tell the patients, look, there is, even if I have completely removed the cavernoma, there is still a um, um, overall rebleeding rate of um, around 3% because also this is a genetic disease. And uh, if you may have microscopic small remaining parts of the cavernoma inside the brain stem that you cannot even detect during the surgery, uh, these can develop into an, a new cavernoma over years, and these potentially also then can uh, bleed again. So patients should know that. But definitely I uh, cannot recommend gamma knife surgery because gamma knife uh, will not prevent uh, um, a future bleeding. I have many examples to prove this. To come to an end, we are doing also a lot of basic research, which I'm not uh, going now to address in, in detail. I have a very good collaborator. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Suvi Carr, who is uh, not a neurosurgeon, so he's a biologist and he's working in my lab under my supervision. And uh, we have published our results. He has a very good um, relationship with many scientists uh, of Europe, of the um, of United States, and even also uh, with the uh, um, UK. Uh, I, I think he has some relationship already. Let me skip this because these are uh, rather um, important uh, conclusions for neurosurgeons. Um, let me conclude like this, with a good selection of the patient and a good timing if surgery is indicated and with a good neurosurgical technique based on a long-standing experience, I can achieve quite good results in more than 90% of patients and the remaining 10% are still uh, uh, in, in a good condition. I thank you for your attention.